any of you theater people ever see uh, Actors Nightmare? It's where you wake up and you're on stage and you don't know your lines and you're waiting for somebody in the wings to feed you lines. Um, today's that day for me, so welcome to my ongoing nightmare um, and or the most exciting challenge I've ever faced. Um, on my way in today, we were getting some splitter cable and I get this text message from Jenna that says, um, you're on <laughs> and I, yes, here we are. So let me ask you a question. And I want you to think about this for a minute before you answer. And if you have a writing utensil or an electronic device, I would like you to write down your answer. The question I'm going to ask you is, what are three things you complained about this week? <laughs> three things this week. Be honest. I'm not going to make you raise your hand. We are not going to get into working groups around this. Um, this is also not your Freud moment. So three things that you have complained about this week. Carry on. Okay, I'm going to assume that we have all registered three things. Why am I going to talk about what's in it for me? Uh, we have all been told that what's in it for me is not the question we're allowed to ask. We are leaders, after all. We are here for everybody else. We are selfless. Women, we are mothers. You push something out of that womb, it's not about you anymore. It's about them. Ask my children, they will tell you. As parents, as leaders, as members of society, we are often told if we ask, what's in it for me, we are selfish. That is a persona. That is a type of person. We don't hang out with that person. And what I want to tell you is all of these people and the 400, 500, some odd others that I met asked and answered the question, what's in it for me? So who are these people that I met? It was 2009, right after I finished Leadership Denver 2008, the most benevolent class ever. <laughs> and, you know, something happens when you're in Leadership Denver. Um, you get a little itchy scratchy, or you, you know, meet some guy who asks you what would you do if you won the lottery, and after you buy your Porsche Cayenne, you tell them you're going to travel to all 50 states, and you are going to find people who are solving problems in their communities. Why? Because anybody remember 2009? It sucked. <laughs> that was a very bad year. Not for Southwest, I flew it twice a week. Um, very, very, very bad year. Very bad year. And in Leadership Denver in 2008, I had all of these phenomenal people like Carla, like all of you, who were looking at each other and saying, what is coming up? What's going to be like? What's going on in our life? When will this election get over? Remember the election cycle of 2008? Let's talk about Andrew's voting thing. I don't think we all survived that crisis so well. But we were in this crazy, crazy state where we were waiting for somebody else to solve our problems. Is that what they teach in Leadership Denver? No. We are taught to go out and solve problems. But the reality is, when your 401k is disappearing, when your stock options are no longer effective, when your salary might have to uh, take a cut, you want somebody's help. And that's what 2008 looked like in Leadership Denver. And here comes this situation, and I have this thing, I won't complain about a problem unless I'm willing to work on the solution. It's terrible, it was great at 14, not so great anymore. <laughs> and I start having this conversation with this guy, he's in the back of the room, and I start talking for three hours about how I'm going to go travel to all 50 states and I'm going to meet with every governor. <clears throat> They're going to meet me. I just won the lottery. I'm going to con contribute to their campaigns. And I'm going to ask them, what are they doing to engage people to solve problems? Ordinary people, not just the politicals. What about the rest of us who are working every single day? How are they engaging us? And for three hours I talked his ear off because I felt like it was urgent. It wasn't just a, ooh, this is a cool idea. It was urgent. We needed something in America, and we still need something in America. And so I, you know, did what Leadership Denver people do. I, I made a board and filed for a 501c3 and quit my job on October 31st, 2008. Day of the first bank collapse. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I was with Denver Health at the time. 
Um, I had won an award. I went to Israel to take it. I came back three weeks later. I had flown out on election day. When I landed back in Denver, my board said, how about you get on your hands and knees and you crawl back to that hospital and you beg for your job back? Because it's not going to be pretty. But I had told everybody that I was going to do it. And if I thought people needed help before the economy actually started collapsing, didn't they need more now? And I had this premise. I believed that I could go out and find ordinary people, people who looked like not just you and I, right? We're the leaders in this community. What about every single person on the street? What if I told you that it didn't matter what you look like, what you sound like, how much money or education you have, that you too could solve a problem in your community? What if I told you I met 500 people like that from age 14 to 91, an unbelievable plethora of religions and races and socioeconomic backgrounds from recently homeless to multi-billionaire with a B, boys and girls, and everywhere in between. And what did they do? When I got back from traveling to all 50 states on Southwest Airlines, did I mention that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I had so many miles, and I, you know, it was great. I was an A-lister. It was awesome. It was really, really, really good. I miss it. It was good. No, I, I love being with you, honey. I do. It's so great. Um, but it was, you know, something else. But what if I tell you that these people, right? Here's a sampling. Um, this is the slide I made 15 minutes ago, isn't it lovely? Um, those are snapshots from my YouTube page. <laughs> so, um, what if I told you that all of these people, 500 of them that I interviewed, um, Michael here edited all of the videos, 375 videos. What if I told you that every single one of them had to start by answering the question, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Why is that important? Because when I met a woman in Daphne, Alabama, I was very excited to go to Daphne, Alabama, because my name is Daphna, and it does not appear in society, even if it's misspelled, wrong letters, wrong pronunciation, I did not care. I was in Daphne, Alabama. Daphne, got way lost, but I was in Daphne. And the woman, Cassandra Boykin, who sat in front of me, told me about how she was involved in her church. She did not have children, but she was very involved in her church. And one day she is at work at a bank and she gets a phone call. And three of the boys in her church, friends, got into an argument in front of the church and they pulled out weapons and they killed each other. Three teenage boys in a heartbeat, a community devastated. These are not her children, but don't let her hear me say that. She did not push them out of her womb, but they lived in her heart. And all of a sudden, she had a problem. And she knew she had the problem. She knew there was a problem that the kids in her neighborhood didn't have anything to do after school if they went to school. They had nothing to do. And she went to the deacon in her church and said, we are going to start an after school snack program and we're gonna help with homework. And he said, Amen, sister. Make it so. She didn't have any money. But she knew that she did not ever want to get a phone call like that again. What's in it for Cassandra? Not answering the phone and hearing three boys dead. That's what's in it for Cassandra. But does she leave it at making an after school program? No. Because what happens? The kids come and they're hungry and they're not going to get dinner. And she knows they're not going to get dinner. So she starts feeding them dinner because her heart can't handle, goodbye, Miss Cassandra. I can't wait till tomorrow when I get snack because that will be my meal. So she starts feeding them breakfast. And she starts building a building. It's 2009. Nobody could get a loan. She worked at a bank. She knew how to get a loan. She didn't have money. Her community didn't have money. But she figured, God will provide. Amen. We should all, right? God will provide. She built the building. And she fed the children. And the shootings didn't happen. Would they have happened again? Maybe, maybe not. But Cassandra's what's in it for me was I can't answer the phone and hear three children dead. Let's go to, to Atlanta, Georgia. And there is a mother 
stay-at-home mom, three children, worst nightmare. At 14 years old, 14, I have a, an almost 14-year-old. 14 14-year-olds 14 are vibrant, full of life, crazy pains in the rump. Middle schoolers, terrible people. <laughs> terrible. Her daughter stops progressing. 14. It's kind of hard to figure out that you've stopped progressing. Because 14 is smart, right? 14 has a lot of knowledge. But she figured out that her daughter wasn't maturing anymore. And they started going to doctors. They went gluten-free. They did all sorts of therapy and shots and this and that and the other thing. And went to tens of doctors. And finally, a doctor said to her, honey, this is what you have. Deal with it. Her daughter had a rare genetic disease. And wouldn't you know it, their youngest son did too. And at about 14 years old, he stopped progressing. So here, stay at home mom, dad worked for UPS. All of a sudden, dad gets an option to retire early, and he takes it. And just about that time, their daughter ages out of state programming. She's 22 years old, her life consists of bagging groceries for half a day, and sitting in front of the television, depressed for the rest of the day. Every single day, there is no repeat. That is what this girl's life is, because there are no programs for her. What's in it for mom? I don't like having divorced children. Uh, sorry, depressed children. I don't want to have divorced children either, but that's a whole nother over. <laughs> so I don't like having depressed children, and my daughter is depressed. Not only that, 14-year-olds have hormones, and she's 22, but she has a woman's body. So she has urges and needs and desires that cannot be met in a safe way, bagging groceries half a day on the couch the rest of the day. So mom, and now stay-at-home dad, because he's retired early from UPS, decide they're going to start a program. So they go out and they find a place in the local community center which is underused because guess what? It's 2009 and so many programs failed in 2009. There was vacant space. And the community center is great. You take our vacant space. And they started spreading the word out in Swanee, Georgia, where they live, uh, near Atlanta, and finding other kids who were similar. And she calls them kids, but they're adults. They're grown. They're in their 20s and 30s and 40s and even 50s. And she started gathering them together and teaching them how to cook and teaching them how to celebrate and teaching them how to enjoy a football game. Not joking. Football was a big part of their culture. And they learned how to play volleyball. So here are these high-functioning disabled adults who are finally finding a place where they can bond and have relationships. And guess what? Her daughter started dating a young man who had had a um, traumatic brain injury from a motorcycle accident. No helmet. He's lucky he survived. But at 16, his development stopped. And they were a perfect match. So when I got there, they were already dating. She answered, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? So let me ask you a question. I asked you about three things that you complained about. I want you to think about one of them. I want you to think about the one that you complain about the most, right? It's a regular occurrence in your mind. You think it only X. What is that one? What's in it for you to solve it? So normally, I would say in a room not like this, but a room of people who weren't identified as leaders, that not everyone is a leader. One of the things that I found when I traveled this country, and my God, I encourage every single one of you, really, don't necessarily have to quit your jobs to do it. I don't know if that was fiscally the best decision I ever made. However, this country is incredible. It is rich, it is beautiful, it is culturally a country that cares about one another. Don't let the news lie to you. That is what our country is. Our country does care. We do answer what's in it for me. But what if I told you that all of these people aren't leaders? Some of them needed somebody to push them. Some, some of them needed somebody to support them. <coughs> there was not one person that I met that wasn't a cheerleader or didn't have one. 
So when I went to Delaware, Delaware was my first state, and I was laughing because Jamie Van Leeuwen just posted on Facebook that Delaware was the 50th state he got to, right? Delaware was the first state on my journey because Delaware is the first state, right? And my very first interview, and it was crazy. Remember 2009 collapse of the economy? So no camera crew with me, no ground crew with me. Um, Michael had taught me how to use the camera, how to turn on the microphone, make sure it was working. I'm freaking out. It's the middle of the night. I'm going into the school building in the dark. I had just <laughs> figured out that it was the first time I'd ever rented a car by myself because I got married the first time young. Like all of this crazy stuff. And I'm sitting down in front of this guy. And here's this really cool dude in this gym high school in Delaware. And he starts to say to me, yeah, this wasn't my idea. And I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be a nightmare. This is my first interview. It's not even this guy's idea. And it's the Delaware Sports League, which, by the way, in Delaware, which has a really thriving young workforce because lots of insurance companies because no taxes. Um, so all of these people who are in cubicles day and night have nowhere to hang out at this time in 2008, nine, but the bars. And it's not for everybody. So somebody comes to this guy, Bobby, and says, hey, Bobby, I heard about these adult sports leagues where they're playing things like kickball and dodgeball, and what if we had that in Delaware? And he's like, okay, I'll do that. What's in it for Bobby, first of all? Place to meet people, something to do. He needed work, it was 2009, everybody needed work. And he took somebody else's idea and they cheered him on and he made it happen. And what I learned consistently and what I say to you, if your number one item that you complain about, that you can answer the question, what's in it for me about, and you're not the one to solve it, I bet you know who that person is. Go be their cheerleader, encourage them. Because when you do, what's in it for me becomes what's in it for we. And when we get to what's in it for we, that's the society we want to live in. Thank you.